All right, we're starting and we're recording. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm going to be facilitating this meeting since we don't technically have a chair yet. We will by the end of the meeting because it's one of our agenda items. Um, but good evening, I'm Kiko. I'm the public health director for the town. Um, I'm officially opening the meeting of the Board of Health, August 8th, 2024. I'm realizing that I don't have the preamble that Maureen used to read as the chair, which is this um, you know, legal information that says that it's okay for Governor Healy for us to hold these meetings virtually. It's a provision that happened during COVID. And I remember that a couple of times we had to send it to Maureen. Kyle, do you have that handy? I am looking in the share drive for it now. These are the details that sometimes escape us until we're in the hot seat, so. Question on whether we have to do that because the other town boards I have been part of do not. Is that right? Okay. Um, so worth, I, I can make a note to see if I can figure out if that's an actual requirement or not. Kiko, I'm sending it to you via Teams right now in case you wanted to. Okay. Thank you, Kyle. Right. It's making me log into Teams again. Okay. So I'll just read it, but we will get clarity on this. Thank you, Risha, for offering that. Uh, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and renewed by Governor Mara Healy, this meeting of the Board of Health would be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instruction on the Board of Health posted agenda via Zoom. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings as soon as it is technologically possible. After this meeting, all approved Board of Health minutes are posted on our website once they are approved by the board. I will now open the August 8th Board of Health meeting at five o'clock with the roll call. So I'm gonna start with you, Risha. Yes. Present, I forget what we say. Yeah, that, that works. Uh, Premila Mayor? Pre present. Uh, Betsy Brooks? Present. And Jack Jemsek? Present. Thank you. Um, so our first order of business is to review the minutes from the last meeting, July 11th, which two of our new board members were not at because they were not board members at that time. Um, but we have Rishan Premila here. Not a quorum, um, but it's what we have in terms of approving those minutes. Um, so did folks get a chance to look at them? It was, a, it was literally a 10 minute meeting that we had in July, which was simply held to approve minutes from the past meeting in June. Yeah, they look fine to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Me too. Great. So, so a motion to approve? I, I can motion if we don't have a quorum, I don't know that it matters, but I can motion to approve. Thanks. And I can second. All right, great. So, and, and all in favor? Thanks. Uh, you as well? Okay, yep, great. I, I think that's, I think that's fine. It was not, there was nothing really substantial in there. So it feels okay not to have an official quorum. That's all right. Okay, so now the next item on the agenda is public comment. Do we have anybody? Set I don't see any comment? attendees, so I think no we're attendees. Okay. Okay, great. So we will move along. Um, I thought it would be great. So initially we had thought to do this meeting in person. Um, it's pouring rain outside, so it's kind of nice that we didn't end up doing it in person. And also because Premila wasn't able to join and we don't really have our full complement of board members, we're still missing one person who has yet to be identified. So then we pivoted to just to do this meeting virtually. Um, but it would be great just to uh, have you, Jack, and have, have everyone introduce themselves, just briefly name, you know, what you do and why you're here on the board, um, just so we can get to know each other a little bit. That would be great. Um, so I'm Betsy, I'm looking at you because you're the first person I see on my screen. So I'm going to start <laughs> with you. <laughs> okay. My name is uh, Betsy Brooks. I'm a retired pediatrician. I retired uh, actually last November 
I had been uh, previously at Holyoke Pediatrics for 35 plus years, and then the regional medical director at the um, uh, primary care network associated with Children's Hospital that a lot of the, I think uh, most of the regional pedi pediatric offices are part of. And I've lived uh, in Amherst and actually the house that I still live in for 40 years now. Oh. Um, and uh, I live next door <laughs> to Risha. <laughs> Connection. Yep. <laughs> Who was not the person who um, <laughs> who solicited me to join? Um, right. So, the, and that that was actually Maureen, who you know well, right? Who suggested yes. you? Apply. I've known Maureen for almost forty years, right. and um, both Maureen and Diane Amsterdam are two close friends of mine who have served on the board. Yes. Well, thank you, Betsy. Welcome. We're so happy to have you. So happy to be here. So keeping on along the theme of new folks, Jack, I'm going to turn it to you. Yeah. Oh, is, is this uh, being recorded? It is. Oh, okay. All right. I got to keep it um, official then. Uh, <laughs> professional, not official. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm a hydrogeologist in the area. I've been a consultant for, again, that 35 number sounds about right for me too. Um, and I have been an Amherst resident since 2000. And previous to this, I started doing some community service uh, probably eight years ago on the planning board. I served two terms on the planning board and uh, six years total. And then I've just been on some other uh, boards, one being, oh, I'm currently on the Water Supply Protection uh, uh, Committee. So, um, but yeah, other things, I was involved with the dog park and the solar bylaw working group. Uh, so, and I was, and, and then Paul Bachman knows me and I guess the person that was previous to me had some groundwater experience or, or kind of engineering. So I'm kind of filling that role, I guess. So I'm pleased to be on here and uh, well, uh, hello everybody. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Are the beautiful sunflowers real or virtual? Though, well, uh, they're real from ten years ago, but I got another crop coming in, so we'll see if I can do it as well. <laughs> Trick <laughs> so question. That, that is, that's our backyard. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. That yeah. is beautiful. They look and, like they're they're taller than you. Yeah. Well, I have a. I'm in a in a basement office, so I kind of need something more attractive than. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. So. Yeah. Well. <laughs> It's, and it's nice for all of us, too. We enjoy seeing that. Yeah. So thank you. It's great. Thank you so much, Jack. Really happy to have you as part of the board. Thanks. Um, Risha. Sure. Um, and it's great to have you guys. I'm really excited about the, the next phase of this board. Um, so I'm Risha. I grew up here as a child um, and then returned in 2020. In between, I was um, working international public health, uh, mostly maternal and reproductive health, HIV, family planning, abortion, maternity, et cetera. Um, I am also on um, the Survival Center Board and uh, was previously on the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, I'm on the Roger E. Wallace Teachers uh, in Excellence Board. And uh, the Ethiopian Ultimate Club board, oddly enough. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm a consultant now in, in international health. Thanks, Risha. That's quite the diverse board experience. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic, great. Risha, are, are you an MD? No, oh. I am not. I am. Okay. A, I come from a business background. I'm more about uh, running the programs than actually doing any of the work. Okay. Thanks, Risha. And we, you know how much we appreciate having you on the board, so thanks a lot. Um, and Premila, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Risha, did you say Ethiopian ultimate? Yeah, that's where I was living before here. So. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> they, they need a board, so I'm on it. 
Yeah, that's very unusual. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm Premila Nair. Uh, Betsy, you and I have actually met at the, um, I think at the House of Diane Amsterdam when she had the meeting about um, abortion providers. Oh, uh, uh, yes. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, and, and Jack, actually, you and I have met. Um, yes, uh, I, I, Bob, I told Bobby yeah, that yeah. You're, you're on the board. So that's my wife. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm friends with uh, Jack's wife, Bobby. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I'm a nurse practitioner. I currently work at uh, Smith, the health services at Smith College. Um, prior to that, I worked at UMass and then uh, at a community health center in Springfield. Um, I worked overseas with refugees um, for many years, um, since 1979. And I've lived in Amherst for 33 years, um, or born and raised in Singapore originally. Mm. That's it. Wonderful. Thanks, Premila. And it's You're nice welcome. to see all these connections. It really is a, a small community. People do kind of tend to you know, cross paths with each other. So it's great that you've met folks in other settings. Um, okay, so in terms of um, orientation, um, Betsy and Jack, you both received um, an, a, a, a manual about what it means to participate in general on boards and committees for the town. I mean, Jack, you obviously have some experience um, and you were both sworn in, you told us. So you've gotten that sort of official onboarding. And then we are putting together an orientation manual. It's almost completed. It is in PDF form. So Jack, we definitely wanted to, we took yeah. your advice mm -hmm. and it's a virtual um, manual, electronic manual that um, Kyle's been working really hard on. It's almost finished. So we'll send that out to you. It, it has, you know, most of the background just about the charge of the Board of Health, uh, you know, the establishment of Boards of Health through mass general law, um, some other kind of legal stuff, open meeting law, which might be somewhat redundant to some things that you've already received. And also the minutes from the last year and sort of summary of the work that the board has done over the last couple of years um, and contact information for everyone on the board as well as the public health department staff. And as I'm talking, I'm wondering, so Risha, you started when I started and I don't know whether you got an orientation manual, you did not. So we'll send it to you as well. Um, and Premila, I'm not sure if you, I'm assuming you got one because you had been on the board yes, for a year. Yes, I did. So you did, okay. Um, so the only thing that would be different, I mean, we can email this to you so you have it. It's slightly updated if you'd like. Okay. And it has That's the updated okay. contact information for everybody too, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Any questions about orientation, about the charge of the board? Um, whoop, yeah, I'm on. Um, Kiko, how about you and Kyle? Because uh, I I think I remember most, but a little brief background would be good. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks for asking. Mm -hmm. um, Kyle, do you want to go first? Yes, I had to make sure I was off mute. Um, so I'm Kyle. I'm the public health program assistant here at the health department. Uh, I graduated from UMass in 2023 with a bachelor's in public health, and then in 2024 with a master's in health policy and management. Um, and right now I just kind of assist in this role with the board and kind of organizing things, doing some preliminary research and just compiling things for you guys. So I hope to have that orientation out pretty soon. Um, and I'm going to try to make it pretty user friendly. So fingers crossed on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Um, and so I'm, I'm Kiko Mallon. I've been in this job only since last October. So it hasn't even been a full year yet. Um, my public health experience has mostly been on the West Coast in Oregon and California. I grew up in the eastern part of Massachusetts, so I am a New Englander by birth, but I moved out to the West Coast in the mid-80s, thinking I would never come back. Um, it was just sort of important for me to stretch my, you know, wings and do something different. And I really enjoyed what I learned on the West Coast. I was working mostly in maternal child health, reproductive health most of my career, and ended up um, in Oakland, California, where I lived for almost 25 years. I was the Family Health Services Division Director for the Alameda County Public Health Department in Oakland for 12 years. And that was 
a job I really enjoy, you know, big health department, big division. I had 200 staff in my division that were doing all kinds of things ranging from home visiting for young families with kids under the age of five to services for children with special health care needs to policy work. We had lots of funding from various sources, federal and otherwise. So it was a big job in a very diverse and sort of busy city, um, which I enjoyed doing for many years. But then I decided to moved back to Massachusetts mostly to be closer to family. Um, my mom is aging and having some health problems and she's been the primary care caregiver for my sister who's been disabled since she was 12 years old and she's now 53. So my mom's no longer able to serve in that caregiving role for my sister. And it was really so difficult to manage all of this from 3000 miles away during a pandemic. Eventually I thought I just have to be closer. So I decided to move back to Massachusetts. I came back two years ago. I worked in Northampton at the Department of Health and Human Services for a year as their substance use prevention team director, and then came over here to Amherst to be the public health director. And I've landed in such a good spot. I'm very, very happy to be here. Love the folks that I work with, really enjoy working with the board and the other um, staff in the town. So it's a great great thing for me. Very different job. I used to be super hyper focused on a very specific area. And now it's everything that comes across my desk that could be potentially related to the public's health in Amherst that I that I need to manage. So it's been a lear steep learning curve, but it's been really fun. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, mm -hmm. I also wanted to mention that, you know, our health department is small. So we have Kyle, who's been full time this summer, but was part time when he was in school. And Sadly, probably won't be here, won't be with us forever, is going to be moving, you know, he graduated, so he'll be moving away soon, and we're going to try to keep him on for as long as we can, but eventually he won't be working for us anymore, <laughs> and we'll be looking for another public health program assistant, hopefully. It's been really helpful to have someone in that job. Um, we also have a full-time public health nurse, Olivia Lara Cahoon, who's been with the department for two and a half years, and she does all of our vaccines and vaccine for children program and a lot of health education and just supporting people in the community. So she's a super important staff person. And then we also have a, a Nancy Schroeder, who is retired from the housing authority for many, many years, is a longtime Amherst resident, knows everybody and everything that's going on in the town. And is sort of our sort of resident historian for public health and for the town. She works part time, just 12 hours a week, but she's a terrific person to have on board. And she does the minutes for these meetings. So she'll be listening to this recording and transcribing it into meeting minutes that we'll review next time. So that's the public health department, small but mighty. Um, then, uh, but you have inspectors, but oh, that's, that's I wrote that building. down to say something about it and promptly forgot. So thank you oh. for asking. Yes, yeah. so there are three inspectors. There are two okay. health inspectors, Susan Malone and Sasha Clapp. Yeah. And then Ed Smith is the lead um, code enforcement inspector and he, is the supervisor and then does is sort of the most senior person who does all the higher level stuff. But they don't report to me as the health director. They're okay. part of the planning department here in the town. There was a separation that happened, I think, more than 10 years ago where the inspectors got moved to planning from public health. And I work very closely with them. We have a twice a month meeting. There's also a big meeting of the inspect all the inspections group, including the plumbers, the electricians, folks who do all those kinds of inspections. And I try to sit in on those meetings. So I'm just aware of what's going on in the community. So definitely very well connected. Sasha and Susan, we work with closely. You know, a lot of times people, if they have a complaint about a restaurant, they call us first. Kyle fields the call to Susan or, or Sasha and they get on it right away and they let us know what they're discovering when they go out to do a restaurant inspection. Um, and if there is something that's going on with a restaurant to the point that it needs to come before the board, the inspectors will attend this meeting. They are agents of the Board of Health. And so they they are connected to this meeting for those kinds of issues for um, well applications, geothermal well applications are also handled by, handled by them. So they make occasional appearances at this meeting. And so that's how we're set up here in town. Anything else, other questions? Okay, so I think we can move on then to our next agenda item, which is old business. Um, and these are the, our tobacco regulations that we have had in place for some time. They were revised, I guess, back in 2020. It was a major revision um, and we've gone back to look at them in the last year, I think we started looking at them as a board in January and it's taken us some time to kind of adjust and tweak. We wanted them to be in alignment with 
the changes that are being made to the state template for regulations. You know, local regulations can be stricter than the state, but they have to follow what the state says and can do more if they like. So it's been an ongoing conversation. And um, with that, I'm gonna punt it to Risha because she's really been holding this um, with Maureen. And now that Maureen's gone, she's our chief person on tobacco regulation. So go ahead, Risha. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're not gonna, we're not aiming to make any decisions or even really dive into details today. Um, what I wanted to do is just catch particularly the, the two new members up on where we are and then let you know what the next step is for the next meeting. Um, so in late breaking attachments, you should have received a summary of decisions as well as a cleaned up draft of the regulations as they stand now. So what we did since January, and it, it was quite a slow process, um, was have a series of discussions, both um, there are some edits that are not optional. We have to adhere to the states and therefore incorporate them and then have discussions about the optional pieces. And some of them were quite small and then some of them were substantive. Um, I tried to summarize all of those in that summary document so you can see. We didn't vote on any of those. Those are not done deal decisions. We just sort of understood that the consensus seemed to be leaning in one direction or another. And so I wanted to highlight those so that you know you can voice another opinion on them if you think we, we are headed in the wrong direction. Um, but these are the substantive changes that we have made that are now in the new draft. It, we changed so much um, editorially, it's sort of the outline and the, the way it is, that it doesn't make sense to have a track changes, it just is gobbledygook. So you're getting a clean version, but I'm trying to highlight what changed. Um, and I think there was just the one, um, yeah, so on number nine on the summary document, can you um, I, share your screen with with that? Um, can I share my screen? I didn't print these out, and I think that's okay to do. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen if that's helpful to folks. Okay, I think this is the right one. Does this have a bunch of dates over here? Are you yeah. That? Yeah. So, um, so these are sort of administrative. These were conversations we had one through five. I'm not gonna go over them. You can read them um, after this meeting. Uh, these were three edits that we made that we did not discuss. And so when Maureen and I and the, the state person were sort of going back and forth, it seemed like these were fairly straightforward, but again, we can be totally overrode on that. Um, and then nine, I, I will update. Um, we decided that it didn't make sense for town inspectors to go to non-tobacco outlets to check for regulated products in the tobacco regulations, right? So if, if we want them to go to non-tobacco, um, so there could be tobacco products in stores that are not licensed to sell tobacco products, right? And we could check that they that those don't exist. Um, we decided it wouldn't make sense to put that in these provisions, that that would be um, part of what they could check when they are going to other stores under other directives. Um, so I can update that. that I, I couldn't remember what our decision was, but uh, I was reminded. And then there's three questions here that we haven't landed um, that remain to be decided. Uh, again, they, they are fairly small, but everything small always ends up with long conversations because it's never small. Um, so what I would like to do is have everybody before the next meeting, both review the tobacco regulations as they stand in the current draft, check the list here of what we've decided and needs to be decided and come prepared to say, I think we're going the wrong way on this, or I have questions about this, or um, and then we'll vote ideally uh, to approve uh, with maybe a few changes, um, those regulations. They then have to go to public comment. Pico, am I right on the process there? Yeah. So it's not done, we done, to, but we'd like we to need to do a public hearing, an official public hearing where we make an advertisement in the newspaper that we're holding a hearing to solicit feedback or, you know, get a comment from the public about the 
regulations before they're approved by the board. Yeah. Anything, Premla or Kiko, to add to what I said? And then, then any questions? I I did uh, scan it. And I just I was thinking, wow, is, is some of this stuff you know dated? But you know, given the marijuana laws and and things like that, and so it was definitely new to me that you know we were strict toward tobacco. So this is my my <laughs> lack of experience uh, being on the board of health. So it was interesting. But the one thing that caught my eye was the, like if a establishment was uh, had their license revoked, that that license wasn't made available to someone, another uh, store in town. I think yeah. I read that right. And I thought that was odd, but. Yeah, that struck me as well. Uh, it was a decision made long ago that we were uh, phasing out tobacco licenses as a town. And so every time one closes, you have one less. Hmm. Um, and I do, the the theory is it goes to zero at some point in the future. That was that was yeah. not a decision made in the, in this revision or in the twenty twenty. I don't think. I don't know when that was made. Yeah, I think it predates both of those. I mean, I think it's you know, public health has long really been a watchdog about tobacco, about tobacco related issues. And there has been so much reform with respect to tobacco as a result of advocacy that's been done by public health, you know, sort of spearheaded by public health. And in Amherst, there really was a quite deliberate decision made to be very strict on tobacco, especially on the ability of young people to get access to it when it's really not legal for folks under the age of 21. So I understand it feels a bit restrictive, you know, to say that we are eventually trying to dwindle our the number of available tobacco permits in the town. But that was a deliberate decision that was made by a very sort of tobacco concerned public health board um, at the time. And it was in sync with what was really going on, I think, nationally about tobacco and in Massachusetts as a state where we have quite quite strict laws about tobacco here compared to some other places. Massachusetts and California do. Yeah. Well, anyway, I guess I have to get on board with that. Um, it, it, it's, it just seems restrictive to me, but, um, and I, you know, I'm not a, a, a health uh, professional, but I, you know, I know some people are more susceptible to it than others. And so we're, kind of protecting the most sensitive, you know, among us, I guess. So, yeah. and then that's, that's with cancer and things like that. Some, uh, but that, I'm digressing there in terms of people, you know, living to a hundred, you know, that are smokers sort of thing, but. Um, all right. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I appreciate you expressing your point of view. Um, I, I do think what you were saying earlier, um, Risha, about the public hearings. So um, I think when the tobacco regulations were revised in 2020, there were some additional restrictions that were introduced and there was a hearing that was quite well attended. And I understand there was some lively debate. Uh, I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> I don't think this iteration of the of the regulations is going to have that kind of response because there aren't as many big changes that are happening. But there are some things that are significant, um, some of the things that you've mentioned, but and also that it's been very clearly spelled out in this version of the regulations, again, flowing from the state that flavored wraps. So, you know, not made out of tobacco, but things that are made out of hemp and have flavors in them and are designed to roll either tobacco or potentially marijuana. Those are clearly banned. And that was sort of a gray area for a while. And I think that I've gone into some stores where those things are being sold and was not of the mind to say those have to come off the shelf because it wasn't crystal clear in our regulations. And that has been spelled out. And that will be a change for some of these places. And that may cause some, some stir. Um, so I just think it's, and there, so there may be a few things that are different. Um, we'll just see what happens when it comes time to hold the hearing. Uh, but I just wanted to say that. Go ahead, Betsy. So I, I had two questions that are sort of big picture. Let me know where the conflicts are. 
So what what's changed between um, vaping and and cigarettes? Like the, you know, are there any uh, differences on where you're allowed to vape versus where you're allowed to smoke, or are these, you know, ha, ha, were there any big changes in those? And then are tobacco and vape products that um, again, I only looked at this very quickly. Are those uh, that are sold in uh, cannabis shops not covered by these regulations? Um, how, how, what's, the, what's the politics and the history of these things? So the first thing I'll say is that these regulations don't touch on where people can smoke. It's only where they can buy products um, and, and where you can sell them. Um, and so I don't know the answer on where you, where you can vape versus smoke. Um, I'm going uh -huh. to assume it's the same places, but uh, I don't know that for sure. I can jump in quickly on that. So, uh, Betsy, if you go to our website, um, specifically under the Board of Health website and click regulations, there is a section for tobacco products and smoking. And there's a specific regulation about prohibiting smoking and vaping in workplaces and public places. So that might answer some of your first yeah. questions. Yeah. And and these, again, are statewide laws. So my understanding of it is you, you can't smoke or you can't vape some places and smoke others. You can't do any of it in the same kinds of places, like within 200 feet of a doorway, in workplaces, smoking, vaping, they're equivalent things. And and similarly, the, the regulations that you've discussed, they're 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 pretty much the same for smoking and and vaping. The, the license requirements, the yeah. yeah. And then yes. in terms of the marijuana outlets, to sell tobacco, you need a tobacco seller's license. And so whether you're also a marijuana, I think um I think we actually have banned the two of those things being one, right? Is that I'm, I'm thinking about. I know you can't be an adult only venue and also a non adult only. So right. I don't know if it is clear. I'd have to go back and look if there's clarity on that. But if anywhere you sell tobacco, you need to have a tobacco license. Um, and then the marijuana licensing is separate. Right. But it, it, it certainly has overlaps because of the wraps, because of the various paraphernalia. But and the vape pens, whatever, are, are good for one and the other. And so is that a gray area? I don't think we've talked about that. Yeah, um, it, it, I have to say the landscape has changed so much. Like there are always new products that are coming in. So it is complicated to keep, keep up with all this. Um, but um, any of those electronic nicotine delivery devices, those are all covered under these regulations. So if there are other, if there is paraphernalia that doesn't have a nicotine product associated with it, that can be sold, you know, like pipes and other kinds of things can be sold in non-tobacco places. Um, but all the nicotine has to be in a place that has a permit to sell it. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is that, you know, Jack, to your earlier point, uh, there was a piece of legislation that was introduced and passed, I'm forgetting which town now, Brookline maybe, somewhere in the sort of greater Boston metropolitan area um, that was has been labeled the nicotine free generation um, legislation, which essentially says that anybody after older, younger, born after a certain year cannot buy nicotine products forever in perpetuity so it's not like you once you reach a certain age you can buy them in this particular town i'm forgetting which one once you're if you're born after a certain year you are never going to be able to buy nicotine products so in terms of this idea of being very restrictive like trying to sort of eradicate tobacco or nicotine from you know retail establishments because of its demonstrated health hazards gateway drug, lots of different things that are concerning about it. There are there are much more restrictive policies that are in place than are limiting, you know, to 14 permits here in the town of Amherst that are out there. And there's a movement to kind of really push this. So I think that Amherst is kind of in the middle of being, we really want to be careful. We want to make sure that we're monitoring this. 
I'm not, I don't think this nicotine free generation is something that we've ever talked about here or that is something we would consider. Um, but we, the, the previous board was quite clear about being rather strict about limiting access to this very highly addictive substance. And at the same time, we do really try to be business friendly to the degree possible when things happen. So example, for example, if somebody sells to an underage, you know, we do have, there are com tobacco compliance officers that go out every twice a year to do basically sting operations. They send a young person into these retailers to try to buy tobacco. And if the person in the store sells to the young person without asking for an ID and sells them tobacco, then we get informed about that and we, we cite them, we find them and we suspend their license. But, you know, we work with them on it. We say, okay, you got to pay this fine. And when would you like to suspend the license? Would it be, what's the best time for you? You know, we really try to, they are businesses in our community. They're part of our economy. We want to support them. And we also want to hold them accountable for complying with the laws that are trying to keep people as safe and healthy as possible. So just to give you a little bit more background, since it's a new area for you, Jack, I thought I'd throw that out there. And we can certainly talk about this more as this topic is going to come up on our agenda again next month and perhaps the month after. Yeah, I mean, just from a health perspective, I'm, I again, I'm just trying to remember, you know, nicotine and there's there's TARS and I think is the, the TARS that, that are cancer causing and the nicotine is more like, you know, the drug part of it. Um yeah um i i'm a, i used to smoke a little bit <laughs> so I'm trying to remember <laughs> yeah so i i may not have these uh, facts exactly correct but i think the you know the pediatric literature says among the people who become addicted you know starting to smoke at age 12 um makes it much much more likely than you're that you're going to be a lifelong smoker and um, there are really are, um, you know, even with the vape, well, maybe even especially with the vape devices, because they, you know, they can go under the radar for parents and others that, um, you know, the, that nicotine ad ad addiction has not been decreasing, you know, there's sort of been an upswing mm -hmm. um, and that, uh, you know, the new landscape has been, um, you know, ha had some real risk to it. it. It's it's not like this was all solved and um, no one's smoking anymore or using nicotine products. Yeah. And there are compelling public health reasons to try and um, keep the youngest people from, from becoming yeah. smokers <laughs> right, becoming right, right. users. Yeah, and as you said, I'll just say one more thing on this and then and then I can move us along unless there's a burning issue that people want to keep talking about. But there's a there's a rich literature here, Jack, as as Betsy is alluding to. Um and I think it's true. You know, it used to be just cigarettes and now there are all of these other products and how young people have taken to vaping and the way that vaping has been marketed aggressively by these companies to young people using social media to the point where some of them are not, you know, able to function very well in school because of this vaping. It's a huge concern in the schools. Um, and then just the whole point about how this is a big corporate, these are big corporations that are making lots of money. They disproportionately market in communities of color. There's a whole equity argument about this that's very concerning from a public health standpoint. So there are many reasons to, to restrict or worry about access um, to tobacco products, nicotine products for for young people and for people in general, just from a health standpoint and an equity standpoint. So and anyway, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Risha. Point, um, as you review it, um, also know that this is a very litigious area. Um, and so other towns, departments of health are getting sued by particularly Cumberland Farms, um, which is local, so could happen here too. Um, so if you catch anything that seems you know, that it's it's vague or it might be hard to defend. I think it's useful to highlight that in your review. Such a great point. Thank you for, for flagging that. So so then we have a little homework, right? Everyone has a little homework to go to read over what um, we've sent to you most recently and come to the next board meeting prepared to, you know, answer those questions that you've outlined, Risha, in your document that are still outstanding and then hopefully be able to move towards a final version of these regulations fairly quickly. Does that sound accurate? 
I just wanted to compliment whoever put that document together. It seemed very clear. Again, I just browsed it, but it seemed like it was very well done. I, I was quite impressed with the professionalism and the quality of that document. A lot of hands that predate everyone here on this meeting, but uh, but yes, there's a lot of work done. Thank you. And yes, Kiko, I think that sounded right. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's definitely been a labor of love, a lot of hands. And I really want to compliment Risha for being able to summarize it so succinctly and help us to move us along to getting this finished. So thank you. Okay, so I'll move us to our next item, which is new business, um, which is to nominate and vote on a new chair. So I'm wondering, I mean, uh, if anybody here <laughs> would like to self-nominate um, to be chair. So I'll just speak frank. Risha and I have had some conversations. Premal and I have had some conversations. Risha is interested in being chair. Premal has said it's not something that's really in the cards for her right now. Betsy, you and Jack being new, I wouldn't expect you to step into that role. So through our conversations, Risha, I think it's safe to say, safe to say that you have self-nominated for this position. Would you concur? Um, I, I am willing to self-nominate. I do want to say that I am not dying to do this job and I'm not petitioning for it. So if there is anyone else that would like to raise their hand, I'm more than willing to support anyone else in doing this. Um, but if there isn't, I'm happy to self-nominate. I'm happy to nominate you so you don't have to self-nominate. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> All right, so no one wants to do it is what I'm hearing. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I think Risha has now been official, officially nominated to serve as chair. I did want to say that um, it's just, it's a year commitment. The, the Board of Health member term is a three-year commitment, but the chair is just a year. And that's because, both because we recognize it's a lot of work. I think it's good to sort of keep that role moving among people. Um, it's wonderful, Risha, that you're able to do it. I know it's not your first choice, but very much appreciate that and the support of your colleagues here. So Unless there's any discussion, I'm, I think we'll move forward then to say that Risha has been nominated to serve as chair of the Board of Health for one calendar year or until the membership changes significantly and there's a need to revisit it. And I would I would ask then if somebody would, I guess we just move to a vote then if we can vote to elect Risha Hess as chair of the Board of Health for the calendar for until next year this time. So. Betsy says aye. Aye. Yeah. Pramila? Yes, with much thanks to Risha. <laughs> <laughs> and when Jack? we get together for a potluck, you don't have to bring anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jack. And then the last one. So yes, I mean, there is also theoretically a position of a vice, right? Yeah, we did at some point um, during the time that I've been the health director, we had a board meeting where we did decide to have co-chairs, I think we called them, not vice chairs. Or I don't recall now, I'd have to go back and look at the minutes. But the idea that there would be another person who would step in should the chair not be available or you know need to step back for some reason. So we did codify that through a, a meeting of the board. So I guess we could elect a co-chair, although I would propose that maybe we want to wait till we have our full board before doing that. Yeah, and I'd, I I think I had spoken against co-chairs when that conversation happened, only because we had co-chairs um, on the Affordable Housing Trust, and I found it very difficult to mesh that with open meeting laws, because you're only allowed to have um, two people talking outside of a meeting uh, about meeting business before it becomes a violation. And so if two co-chairs and a third person are talking, even if they're not talking at the same time, that's a violation. Um, and so I, I found that very difficult. So I would not recommend having co-chairs, um, but someone that could step up if I miss a meeting or, you know, can't do something I think would be very useful. If and we have it officially, then we just ask for someone to step in, but it's nice to right. have it official. And, and do you recall, because I think we did actually vote on this in a meeting. So, and I remember you raising this concern before. So I think we must have used the wording vice chair versus co-chair to address this concern since we did vote it in as a board. Yes, I'm pretty sure we we uh, agreed on vice chair. Okay. That Tim was going to be vice chair. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Pramila. 
Um, so, so given that that, I mean, certainly this board could change, could vote to change that. Um, you've made a strong argument, Risha, for why that makes sense. It's currently what's happening. So, unless anyone has strong objection, I would. Sounds like we want to go ahead with that, um, but to wait until uh, we have our full complement of board members to elect a vice chair. Right. Does that sound right? Okay. Great. All right. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so I guess the next item then is for the, is the director's update. I, I did just want to say that these meetings, so the, the Board of Health, if you looked at, um, well, I guess we haven't sent this to you yet because it's part of the orientation manual that we're putting together, but really the charge of the Board of Health is focused around regulations, writing new regulations, you know, amending existing ones, ensuring that we're in alignment as a mun local municipality with state regulations related to public health. It's really about that's the work, that's the meat and potatoes of the board. Um, not so much program planning or other kinds of things, but really around regulations. Um, but there's also a section of the meeting, and we've come to it right now, where I, as the director, or other pro or public health staff will just give you an update on what we're doing programmatically. I think it's important for the board to be aware and also for us to take questions and for you to, you know, have some role in kind of participating in and providing feedback about the programming that we're engaged in. So that's this section of the meeting. So just a couple of things. Um, the first item is to talk about board of health membership. So we still have one um, seat that's vacant and we, have a couple of applications that have come in. There are also a couple of people that have expressed some interest that Paul and I have been talking to. So I'm hoping um, by the end of August that we will have um, the, the fifth member identified so that that person would come to the September meeting, which we can hopefully do in person um, since we'll have everybody um, you know, identified to serve on the board. So that would be, that's the plan there. That's what's happening with that final seat. Any questions about that? Uh, when we meet in person, um, were we in the, the town hall there? What what room do we would? Oh no, there's the downstairs one too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of at this point, it's it's anybody's guess. We have met, and the last time we met in person, it was in the town hall in the town room on the second floor. Yeah. But we would actually prefer to meet here at the Bang Center because that's where the public health department is. It's where our community services hub, you know, our, our, where our community services are located. So Kyla is working on getting a room that we can use here on a monthly basis so that people will be coming to the same place every time when we have an in-person meeting. So we'll have more information about that soon. I believe I requested the Bangs room um, through the rest of the calendar year, but I will double check that and we'll let you all know uh, before the next meeting. And well, you will continue uh, to have a, a Zoom option available. So if we're tra if we're in London, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> I think what works best is to either do it virtually or do it in person. The hybrid meetings can be a little tricky because we don't always have a big screen that someone can join virtually through. Um, so based on member availability, weather, things like that, we will decide ahead of time, will this be an in-person meeting? Will this be a virtual meeting? And I think we'll try to sort of do a blend of the two as the year unfolds. Um, okay, so what else? Mosquito surveillance. So I sent you, so for, for those of you who are new, just a quick overview is that um, Town of Amherst has a contract with the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, um, which does a really good job with mosquito surveillance. So we work, it's really a one-man show, a man named John Briggs, who's like the most dedicated public servant I've ever met. He's out there every day in the trenches um, treating mosquito pools, you know, catch basins, storm drains, other things where mosquito larvae could be growing and surveilling mosquitoes. So he was telling me how he had a whole lab set up in his dining room where he's, you know, looking at mosquitoes and testing them and seeing if there are any that are testing positive for for West Nile or Triple E. Um, so he does that weekly. He's out there surveilling in 
Amherst and in other communities that are part of the PVMCD. And um, at, the, at the very end of last year, he found a West Nile positive mosquito in a pool in North Amherst. So at the very end of the season, really like late September, we didn't have any cases of West Nile virus that we were aware of in Amherst, but there was this one mosquito that was identified at the end of the season. And as I think you all are well aware, we're, it's, it's, the mosquitoes are worse because of climate change, more humidity, more wet rain, heat, all of those lovely things are combining to increase our mosquito population. So we um, carved out some funds to be able to do some treatment. So he did, he's treating some of those areas in North Amherst. He did this first in late June with briquettes, these BTI briquettes. So it's not spray. They're, you know, much, much less toxic. These are little briquettes. You can get them at Home Depot for your own use at home that are put into the storm drains and they kill the larvae versus the adulticide, which is what the spraying does that you might see around town. Um, so he's treated a couple areas and he did an additional treatment today because he found quite increased mosquito growth in some pools in that area of North Amherst. So he's continuing to kind of keep an eye on that. There, there was a West Nile vi virus positive mosquito identified in Holyoke and a couple in West Springfield or East Longmeadow within the last month, but nothing in our town so far. Um, the state really keeps a close eye on this. We get an email every week. We get a phone call every time there's a West Nile virus and positive mosquito someplace. So it's a very closely monitored situation. Um, and the state did just announce this week that there was a West Nile positive human case um, in Hamden County and the first triple E equine case in Plymouth which is kind of what happens around this time of year. Um, we haven't had any triple E in our area in some time, but we are definitely keeping an eye on that and you know, aware of that and cautious, cautious about that since it's a much more fatal concerning disease than West Nile. So I sent you the report, it's fascinating, more information than you'd ever want about arbovirus and mosquitoes. Um, if you feel like looking at it, it's pretty interesting. So you have that um, in the email that Kyle sent and it's also posted to the web. Um, any questions about that? Yes. Um, is there also any surveillance of tick for Lyme? Um, there isn't the equivalent surveillance of tick for Lyme that we are able to contract with. I think UMass does some surveillance. Um, and they have, they certainly have their lab where you can bring ticks for testing. Although that's not really clinically indicated, but it is sort yeah. of from a surveillance standpoint, sort of interesting. But we don't get those data from there. There isn't Kyle, data. No, I, not, not that I know of. Do you have something, data. anything to add there, Kyle? You I believe about? UMass is no longer doing tick testing after COVID. Um, there's a company called Tick Report in Amherst um, that sometimes people send their ticks to to get tested. There is a couple schools of thought of the efficiency of testing ticks. Um, yeah. So. It's not something that we really, you know, refer people to, but it's just something to be aware of. No, I, I think I meant something different, like just knowing how, you know, what the prevalence of um, of of Lyme disease in the ticks in our community. Do we are we following that, or we're just assuming that all the deer ticks carry Lyme? I've definitely seen some statistics, you know, that X percentage of deer ticks are expected to carry Lyme, and I don't know what that's based on. So, so I don't know if there's, an, as far as I know, well, the town certainly doesn't participate in any equivalent tick surveillance as we do mosquito surveillance. Yeah. And I, and I think there's some efforts out there. I'm just not aware, as aware of them, but I will look into this now because I think it's a good question. Yeah, I think it's so much more common that, I mean, people, yeah, it, it's there, a. There's so many more cases that the prevalence is usually tracked through human cases, not through the tick percentage. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not an expert in this either, so I, I don't claim to. But um, I mean, we you you shared the the data around Lyme disease cases that were identified. I did. Yeah. Right. So I mean, it's true that Lyme disease is much more prevalent than West Nile. So we know we have a lot of that, and maybe it, you're, you've articulated it really well. But that's kind of maybe more how the surveillance is done. And I think the state probably on their website has some 
estimates of the prevalence of Lyme disease in the community just based on human cases. Um, but I don't, but it's still another question like what percentage of ticks carry Lyme these days? I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. And whether it's different in Amherst than it is in Lyme, Connecticut or in, or in Maine or someplace else. Yeah. Yep. Because again, originally it was all in Connecticut, you know, it was, it was the, the name Connecticut of the rather from? than local. So we, you worried mm -hmm. about being exposed to a tick elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So yeah, full disclosure here. I, I've learned more about Lyme disease than I uh, care to uh, discuss. <laughs> it is, it is, uh, it, it's makes my head turn thinking all the thing, all the uh, pathogens in, in, in a person's body uh, that doesn't affect some people and affects others. And uh, it's, but anyway, I, I was diagnosed last year, but so yeah, when I saw that, it was like, oh boy, this is got a tiger by the tail there. Yeah. The line. Right. Cause, because public policy is, is terrible and our healthcare is terrible when it comes to, to Lyme. Um, um, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I did. So, you know, this is a good segue then to the um, infectious disease report, which you just alluded to, Betsy. So yeah, there were, a, you know, good number of cases for the month of June of Lyme disease, as well as some others. Um, I always forget how to pronounce it. The be babesiosis. Babesiosis. Oh, babesiosis. 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 Yeah, and the anaplasmosis. We're, we're, and, and we actually don't case Those manage. are other tick-borne diseases for people who don't. Yes, thank don't you. Know Those are other tick-borne diseases. And here at the health department, we don't manage the, we do a lot of case management for infectious disease. You know, So if there's a case of TB, obviously we manage that. Um, and we do follow up on the anaplasmosis and the babesiosis cases, but the Lyme disease, Lyme disease cases are managed through the state. It's just- it, Is Lyme so disease bad. still uh, reportable? It is. Yeah. Yeah. That's how we get these numbers. These are all reported into the infectious disease tracking system. So, but, but I, I would add that this, these numbers are underreported because the, the Western blot, whatever that they're triggered is, is a very poor indicator of when someone has, has Lyme or not. So that's part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. And also people might not access treatment. So it could be an undercount for that reason too. You know, they don't mm. ever get tested, possibly, or they get or they tested maybe much later. Prophylaxed before, be, before um, they have, they may be treated preventatively and therefore not not get it and right, never have a positive test. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I would say you know it's still a significant concern in our community. It's not like the numbers have skyrocketed this summer. I mean, they're sort of around the place that they normally are, maybe slightly higher. Um, but I am interested in this question about tick surveillance. So I'll, I'll follow up on that, see what I can find out. Um, so moving on to the next item, um, changing subjects a bit. We are already beginning to plan some vaccine clinics for the fall. So we've traditionally worked really closely with the Northampton Department of Health and Human Services because they have a public health excellence grant which is part of this whole system of building a regional public health infrastructure for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There will be in your orientation manual um, a really nice document explaining that whole project. It's called the Blueprint for Public Health Excellence, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so they have funding to have staff to do regional work and to organize regional clinics. We are only getting vaccine here for uninsured or underinsured people. We don't get vaccine any longer for people who don't fall into those categories because everything's changed and those vaccines are now available in pharmacies or through primary care physicians, but we still try, or providers. So we do still try to do the vaccine clinics because sometimes people really like to get the vaccine that way. So we'll probably do between, I'd say three and six, clinics here at the Bangs, and then we'll also be going out to the community. We actually have an intern working with us right now, a UMass student, public health, master's in public health student, who's doing a summer project with us, analyzing our current data to understand if there are pockets of the community that are less likely to be vaccinated, or certain populations, certain groups, age groups, racial ethnic groups that might be less likely to be vaccinated. So we could kind of do more strategic promotion or go to those communities versus having them come to us. 
So we really want to try to increase our vaccination rate. Only 25% of people in Amherst got the booster last fall. Um, we would love to see that number increase and also flu. So we're offering both COVID and flu vaccine at these clinics. So we'll be keeping you informed about that. And also looking at the flu vaccination rates. Yep, she's looking at both of those things. It's great to have her. She's looking through all the data. She's going to do a visualization, a little PowerPoint presentation. So that's something we can also share with the board when she's finished with it. And I know that's something you have a particular interest in, Betsy, so I'm definitely excited to have your support with this work. We'll keep you posted about it all. Um, I also wanted to mention, this is something I'd forgotten to put on my list, but I'm just going to add it now, that we did have a sale to a miner, a tobacco retailer did sell to a miner uh, back in June. And so one of these uh, tobacco compliance checks that happened. Uh, so we that was a uh, big guy liquors um, out on in North Amherst on Montague Road, as you're headed out of town just before the turnoff to Mill River. Um, so we, um, they, they were fined and they um, had their license suspended for seven days and they were very compliant and no problems. Um, so they've had violations in the past, not recently, but in the past. So this is the kind of thing that we track. And if somebody has continuous violations, they would come before the Board of Health for a potential suspension of their license. That's not anything that has happened recently, but that is something that could happen if somebody breaks the law repeatedly. Um, two upcoming events that are happening. There's a community safety day at Mill River Recreation on August 17th. It's a Saturday all day. So police and fire are there. It's kind of an interactive, fun, safe community safety day for the community, for young people, kids and public health will be there. We're gonna have the bite lab there, which is an interactive tick mosquito display to help educate people about those insects and the diseases that they carry. So we'll be there staffing that booth and you're welcome all of you to come out. That sounds like a fun way to spend your Saturday, August 17th. And then the other thing that we're excited about is on September 18th, and we sent you these flyers via email, September 17th, sorry, we're doing an open house here at the Bangs. And we really kind of, find that people don't often know what goes on in this building and what kind of services public health provides, where Cress is, you know, what does the senior center do? Where's the Masante clinic? These are all questions that we get. And we're, we've really developed a nice relationship with the clinic, um, working closely with their chief uh, people and equity officer to be more in alignment and to be more kind of arm in arm because we refer people there all the time. We've done lots of events together. We do vaccine campaigns that could be relevant to people who go to their clinic if they're not getting vaccinations there. So this is an opportunity for people to come to the banks and really tour the whole center, understand where everything is, how it all fits together and who the people are who work here. So we're inviting community members, but also so legislators and you know town council members, board members, um, you all are, we'd love to have you if you can stop by. I think it'll be fun. There'll be music and food and kind of a raffle and games and things and also just opportunities to let people know what we do here. So that's upcoming in September. I guess that's, I, I think the two more things I wanted to mention um, is that there is, the board does have responsibility, well, how shall I say this? Public health has responsibility for emergency preparedness. If there were a natural disaster and the need to set up a shelter or something like that, there's obviously a role for public health in that whole situation. And when there are emergencies, the board of health, or at least one or two members of the board of health has been listed as, con as contacts for the emergency alert system. Um, so that's, so it's currently Maureen who's still listed as our chair and as our contact for, um, any kind of emergency alerts. And that's something that we have to change in the next little while. So I think I want to sort of follow up with her and try to remember, is it maybe just one person from the board or two people from the board, one person and a backup that we do. And then there's a web process that you have to get oriented to. So that's just a preview of coming attractions for maybe one or two of you as board members to be listed as the contact for that whole emergency operations procedure. So just putting that out there is something that we'll talk about more. And also as a reminder to myself to make sure to follow up on that. And the last thing I'll tell you is about Puffer's Pond, just because it has come up so much for us here in the health department. And just to make sure that the Board of Health is aware of what's happening at Puffer's and how we manage the situation there. So Puffer's Pond is technically under the jurisdiction or managed by the conservation department. 
And so it is conservation department staff that go out and do weekly testing. They take water samples and they are tested in our lab here and the results are posted to the website. So we're testing for E. coli bacteria. We're testing for exceedances. The standards are all set by the state of Massachusetts, very clear standards. If it's over a certain amount, either a single sample or a geometric mean that's taken over the course of five days, then the recommendation is to close the pond to swimming. There are two beaches. We take samples from each beach. Sometimes one of the beach will pass, the other one will fail. But if one of them fails, we make the decision to close the whole pond to swimming. It's a small pond, people swim across it. If one beach is failing, it doesn't seem like it's safe to say it's okay to swim. Now, this isn't enforced by the police. People go swimming, they go swimming really at their own risk. We're not gonna yell at them or pull them out of the water, but it is technically, signage says that it's close to swimming if the E. coli levels are over these exceedance standards. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously the, the standards are set by the uh, Code for Massachusetts Regulations and the Board of Health is involved in you know managing all that, but it is the Conservation Department who does the testing. It has traditionally been the point person for questions. I think their contact information is listed on all the signs, but we do get a lot of calls here. Um, and I think people understand that the Board of Health is somehow involved. So yes, I'm aware, I'm involved, I'm supporting that the pond is closed because it's not safe to swim, um, but it is the Conservation Department that's doing most of the on-the-ground work. So that's that, there, go ahead. Do you think there's a need to educate people for why that that closes it, you know, what the risks are? Uh, or um, do you think it's obvious? Well, you know, there, we do get a lot of questions. I think mostly people don't really ask so much why. I think folks mostly understand if there's E. coli in the water, that's not good to ingest. It can make you really sick. But we have put a whole frequently asked, I mean, Kyle worked really hard on an FAQ document that's now up on the website that we're driving people towards that does address why it's not good to swim. Obviously, ingestion of contaminated water is the highest risk, but you can also get have rashes, skin rashes, or if it can get gets in your eyes or nose, that can be a potential infection source. So we do have that listed. And we also explain why, how the testing works and why we are doing this. And we also try to explain why this is happening. You know, I think climate change plays a role, aging sewage infrastructure plays a role. We know that it's downstream from some things, you know, bird feces, dog feces, these things can wash into the pond. The heavy rains stir up the sediment. There's a lot that's contributing to it testing positive. And unfortunately, it tends to be closed most of the summer these days. It was open maybe for a couple of weeks in June for swimming, and then we had to close it. And I don't envision that it will clear up before the end of summer. That seems unlikely, especially with this weather that we're having, it doesn't help. So, so that's the story about puffers. I, I was actually interviewed by Western Mass News today about this because it is so much on people's minds and it's it's a beloved place and everyone really wants to swim there. And it's, we don't want to close it, but we also don't want people to get sick. So we have to do what the right thing is for the health of the community and what is stipulated by the state of Massachusetts in terms of standards for beach water quality. Eco, is this a situation where if there were money, there's something we could do about it? Um, it's it's a complicated situation. I think nobody knows for sure what will fix it. I think there, because there are so many contributing factors, one thing we've talked about is dredging the pond, which would be a big operation, would be very expensive, would mean that the pond would essentially be closed for as much as long as a year. And my understanding is that may or may not take care of the problem because I think some of the issue is that it is downstream from some of our, you know, from a aging sewage infrastructure. We have sometimes sewage overflows, pipes are old, people put grease and wipes down the pipes and that doesn't help them to function well. You know, these are all things that can kind of contribute along with climate change. So I think there are some things we can do and there's some studies that are happening to try to pinpoint what the contaminants are that are really driving these exceedances. Um, but any way you slice it, it's going to be quite expensive. And I know that we don't have money in the current budget, but we are pursuing grants to try to think about how we can restore puffers to be a place that people can still come and swim in because it's a, a beautiful place and you want to be able to cool off in the summer. So 
So it will be expensive. And I think we, we really need to, I think we need to understand more about exactly what will be the best thing to do to fix it. So we don't spend money on something that isn't going to help, right? Yeah. How do, how do items get added to the agenda? Is there a process? To this agenda? To this agenda. Yeah. I mean, I think certainly if you have something that you're thinking of right now, it would be great to suggest that some it'd be something that we talk about. So the one um, thing that, I, that, um, that one of our neighbors had uh, an adolescent who died at a track meet because of a... Um, she went into VTAC and had an, arrhythmi an arrhythmia and died. And I know that there's been a lot of things about training. You know, the real thing that you need is defibrillators. And I wonder whether we've looked at placement of defibrillators and training. So in public places, there's someone, you know, when you put a, a defibrillator to, to know that people know how to use it. Uh, and whether there are any guidelines on that, whether that's been addressed by the state, because that seems like something where the um, the the medical literature has actually really moved on that. And you know, I just wonder whether that's a public health issue that we should be addressing. Yeah, I think with that, um, what it's good that you've brought it up. I think as public health staff, we can look into this to see if there, you know, what what does the state say about it? Are there are there current regulations? What what is the status of this? Do we have I know we have AEDs in some places. I don't know who makes decisions about what goes where. We could do a little research. And if it's something that lends itself to a regulation that the Board of Health would want to develop, then that would be that could be a decision that the board would make based on some of the background research that we can do as staff. Yeah. Is there are there any state guidelines how many how many are there what training etc yeah. yeah good question yeah Pico I don't know if this is the right time but I did have a question um on h5n1 and if there's any discussion about dealing with the farms locally um and getting them prepared and PPE and all the things that are being talked about in relation to that um yeah, well, I think this would be the time. I think um, we've moved through my update and so we can sort of talk about any other topics that weren't anticipated 48 hours prior to the meeting. So um, yeah, let's think. We have You wanna gotten... make sure that everyone knows that you're talking about bird flu? Yeah, Yeah. avian okay. flu. Thanks, Betsy, you're so good <laughs> about <laughs> making sure that we're translating everything for people who may not have all that medical background. Um, so uh, I, I haven't gotten what what we had been told maybe six weeks ago was that um, if you have dairy farms, you needed to make sure that people that your animal control officer was going out to ensure that staff in the dairy farms know about the symptoms and are um, you know monitoring their cows for any symptoms. That was back when there were some cows that had tested positive and they were concerned about exposure to milk and that sort of thing. Um, we don't actually have any dairy farms in Amherst any longer. Um, there are certainly some cows in Amherst, but not dairy cows. So I haven't, we haven't received specific direction from the state about any other follow-up around avian flu at this point. Um, but I'm feeling like maybe there should be more clarity around what we need to be doing locally because I haven't heard anything specific. Yeah, I mean, the things that I've heard are not from the state either, um, but would apply to both. And I wonder if it's cattle farms beyond dairy, uh, but also chickens. Yeah. Um, and it is about sort of getting PPE to to folks who handle. I wonder, I don't even know what to do with home chicken farm. You know, <laughs> I know. Uh, the non-industrial versions of that. But, um, but certainly with the formal farms of both of those, I would want to be thinking about what preventative measures can be taken as the cases rise. Yeah. And are we up the ice cream places where there are large Adley. crowds and children and cows? Right. Yep. Yeah. But there's not an Amherst proper. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know that I I mean I can look into whether that's for all cows or just dairy cows. Um, but the chickens leads me to believe it's probably just all of them. Yeah, for chickens. Yeah. No, this is a good point. Um, 
I think we need to, if you, if you hear of anything or you, whatever sources you're hearing from that aren't state sources, but there's information, I'd love to see whatever it is you've consulted. And then I think Kyle and I can also do a little bit of research on this to see whether we should be at least at a minimum putting some information on our website or going out to farms to do some education about PP or whatnot, if that's indicated. That seems to be the, you know, the, the stages that people are recommending right now is really about prevention and education and just making okay. sure that farm workers in particular have what they need um, right. to be protected. Yeah. Okay. Right. But yes, share. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, anything else? And I, I guess just to answer Betsy's original question, how to get something on the agenda, if anyone wants to, uh, I think it's emailing me now. Um, yep. And we have to share everything. Um, you said now 48 hours before. Yeah. The, um, otherwise, it's unanticipated. Right. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Our general practice is to, so normally what I do is get in touch with the chair, you know, maybe a week and a half before the meeting and talk about what, what did we talk about the last meeting? What needs to, what's come up since then? What do we need to put on the agenda? But certainly as Risha said, if you have items other than what we've just talked about, email those to Risha and me. Um, and then Kyle usually sends out all the materials the Thursday or Friday, the week before. So they go out a little bit earlier, but they have to go out per open meeting law 48 hours ahead of time. And they have to be posted on the website 48 hours ahead of time at a minimum. Um, so Risha, since you're now the chair, can I turn it to you to adjourn our meeting if there isn't anything else that people would like to? Oh, this is very exciting. Uh, <laughs> I motion to adjourn. <laughs> Approved. Seconded. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think technically you're supposed to take a vote, right? So you 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 moved and Go you hands. seconded and all in favor. Right? All in favor, say aye. 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 It's eleven seventeen p.m. here, so I think I am done. Thanks for <laughs> hanging in there, Pramila. <laughs> I appreciate it. Mm. Okay. Take care. All right. Bye, Thanks everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.